Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are reading two books, the first and second books of Thessalonians, and it's actually a pretty short reading assignment. But in there, Paul is teaching a lot of incredible things that are so relevant to our day today, and it reminds me of several church history stories that I'm also excited to share with you. Now, just the little historical background of what's going on, Paul went to these people, he taught them, he converted so many of them, he established the church, and then there were some people that were angry with him and what was going on, and so nearly for the safety of his life, he had to get out of town, which he did. And then being concerned and, and uh, wanting to know the status of the saints, um, he sent a letter over to him. His little assistant, his companion, Timothy, uh, was there in the area, and he reported back uh, that there were good he reported good tidings of their faith and charity. And here, Paul, we can't, uh, we can only imagine um, his excitement and his joy in receiving that good word. These saints that he had been so worried about that were in the midst of, of persecution, at least the verbal religious persecution, and uh, they were coming out of it. They were coming through with it with faith, with charity, clinging on to those things that Paul had taught him. And so he must have been greatly rejoicing. In fact, we can, we can sense that in these, in these two books, these two letters, the first and second books of Thessalonians, in which he's now, after receiving that report from Timothy, he's sending these letters, and there's a lot of joy and happiness in there. And it's nearly as though he's saying, okay, look, you stayed true and faithful, so let me teach you a little more. Let me take you a little deeper. Let me, let, let's elevate not only your discipleship, but also uh, the organization and the structure so that, that you and those that will come after you are going to flourish in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when I say that this is so relevant to us today, it really is. We're in a similar situation, many individually perhaps, but collectively as a church where, hey, we see President Nelson saying, hey, we can do more. We can lift up and become more, uh, and, and that more being everything that Heavenly Father knows that we can become and everything that He wants us to become so that He can bless us even more abundantly. And so those are the couple of things that I'd like to pull out of these, uh, these, the, this scripture reading. And then uh, also, like I, I love to do, interject a couple of church history stories as well. So let's go to the first uh, book of Thessalonians. I don't know if they call it the first book, but the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. So the next one will be the second epistle. So, but the first Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5, we start to get uh, some of this information. Paul is kind of reminding them that, uh, hey, when I was there, I taught you. And in verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you. So when I was there preaching, the gospel didn't wasn't taught by me to you uh, by word only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Now, as I said a moment ago, not only can we relate these things to us, but these letters can really teach us as well how to, how to be faithful saints in the church and also how to help others be faithful saints in the church. Now, what opportunity has Heavenly Father given us to help others be faithful members of the church? He's given us callings and responsibilities in his kingdom. He's entrusted us with that very task in helping others come unto Christ. So, yes, in these letters, we're going to learn how to be better saints, come closer to Christ, but we're also going to learn how to help others do the same. And we get that first teaching there in verse 5, where the example of Paul is, I didn't just teach you in words. I didn't just flower things up and make it seem nice and friendly, you know, and, and desirable through my words, but you had desires to come unto Christ because of the way he taught. And that was with power and authority to teach. And when he taught in that way, he taught with the Holy Ghost. And it was the Holy Ghost that entered into their hearts and converted them to the gospel of Jesus Christ and motivated them to stay on that covenant path and continue to move down that path. We also get this same teaching in uh, the Book of Mormon. In Alma chapter 17, the sons of Mosiah are out teaching the Lamanites. And in verse 2 of that chapter, now these sons of Mosiah were with Alma at the time of, 
that the angel first appeared unto him. Therefore Alma did rejoice exceedingly to see his brethren. And what added more to his joy? They were still his brethren in the Lord. Yea, they had, and now here comes the, the details, they had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth. For they were men of sound understanding, and they had searched the scriptures diligently. So two things that they had done so far, and what for? And what for? That they might know the word of God. Now that they've obtained the word of God through those two steps, we continue in verse 3. But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore, as a result of that, they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. So with that, they were then able to teach and not just teach, but teach with power and authority from God. So in our responsibilities, <clears throat> there sets the pattern of how to serve in the church. Paul teaches us, and now in the book of Alma, we're learning how to do it. Wax strong in the knowledge of truth. Search the scriptures diligently. So we obtain the word. And then once we obtain the word, give ourselves to much prayer and fasting so that we have the spirit of revelation, so that we know what to teach and who to teach and how to teach it. And then when they taught, they taught with power and authority from God. Now we take that teaching from the book of Alma, bring it back to 1 Thessalonians. And what happens when we teach with power? We do so with the Holy Ghost. And then take that to the Doctrine and Covenants, which says that when... When we, when we teach and learn of each other with the power of the Holy Ghost, it's the Holy Ghost that's teaching us, that's uh, enlightening our minds and our understanding. I've got a story about Brigham Young. Brigham Young uh, first uh, learned about the gospel by being introduced to the Book of Mormon, actually being given a copy of the Book of Mormon by his brother, Phineas Young, who had obtained a copy of the Book of Mormon from Samuel Smith, the younger brother of the prophet, Joseph Smith. Phineas gave it to Brigham. Phineas was all in. His conversion was quick. He loved it. He grasped it. He said, yes, I love it. I want it. I, I know it's true. Brigham, you got to jump all over this. This is great stuff. Brigham took it. He studied it. He read it for two years before embracing it. And what was it at the nearly at the end of those two years that, that just solidified his testimony. It was this. In fact, it's in his own words. And he shares in his own words his conversion experience. And that it was just as Paul taught and as it's recorded, the sons of Mosiah, that their process of teaching as well. In that Brigham Young, it wasn't the words, powerful, strong words, eloquent words, uh, convincing words that got him. But it was being taught by someone who was speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost, just as Paul taught and just as the sons of Mosiah did. So here's Brigham Young's conversion story as told by him. If all the talent, tact, wisdom, and refinement of the world had been sent to me with the Book of Mormon, and had declared in the most exalted of earthly eloquence the truth of it, undertaking to prove it by learning of worldly wisdom, they would have been like the smoke which arises only to vanish away. But when I saw a man without eloquence or talents for public speaking, and could only say, I know by the power of the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of the Lord, the Holy Ghost proceeding from that individual illuminated my understanding and light, glory, and immortality were before me. I was encircled by them, filled with them, and I knew for myself that the testimony of the man was true. My own judgment, natural endowments, and education bowed to this simple but mighty testimony there sits the man who baptized me. He points to Brother Miller. It filled my system with light and my soul with joy. The world with all its wisdom and power and with all the glory and gilded show of its kings, 
sank into perfect insignificance compared with the simple, unadored testimony of the servant of God. End of quote. I hope that we don't get caught up thinking that we've got to be so educated, so eloquent, so refined and practiced in our teaching skills that we forget that the only way that an individual comes converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ is by the simple, soft whisperings of the Holy Ghost. We go to chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. So now we talk about uh, so it's kind of a building block here. Uh, we've learned about uh, the way to teach. Now, how do we actually put it into practice? How do we put this into motion and execute what we've already been talking about? We go to chapter 2, and we find a couple of uh, answers to that. In verse 4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. So the first half of verse four, but we were allowed or we were commissioned or called or set apart of God to be put in trust of teaching the gospel. And he did so by, by pleasing God and not man. So doing it God's way. And then he gives a couple of ways of doing it God's way. Verse five, for neither at any time used we flattering words. So how did he teach if it wasn't by flattering words? Well, we go back to what we've just been talking about for 10 minutes. And that is he taught by the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 8, halfway down, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, so we're not here just to teach, just to deliver a message, but also our own souls. We're giving our words and our knowledge and our teaching and helping you feel the Holy Ghost but we're not just the messenger person. We're here to give and offer our whole souls because ye were dear unto us. You think about teaching in the Savior's way. How did the, teach, the Savior teach? He taught by power of the Holy Ghost, of course. He taught um, the words of truth, of doctrine. He helped people understand and comprehend, but it was also coupled with love. The Savior gave his whole soul as Paul is teaching, and he did so as Paul did as well. He did so with an abundance of love. Now, are we teaching and sharing our testimony so that we can get out and convince and make sure that everybody knows that we're right? No, we're doing it with an abundance of love to invite others to, if necessary, lean upon our testimony until they gain their own, but then most and more hopefully, we do it in a way to invite others to obtain their own testimony and their own desire to follow after the Savior. Doctrine and Covenants chapter uh, section 4 teaches this exact same thing. In fact, I like to call section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants the first general handbook of instruction for the church. And that's really what it was. Joseph Smith was living in Harmony, Pennsylvania with his wife, about uh, 140 miles from his home in Palmyra. Well, one day his father, Joseph Smith Sr., comes to pay his son, the prophet, a visit there in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And one of the questions that Father Smith asks his son is, Joseph, what is my role in all of this? You've extended some callings to different people. They have different roles and responsibilities. But what's mine? What am I supposed to be doing, Joseph? Joseph prays and asks the Lord. And this is, if not the first it's one of the first revelations that came to Joseph on behalf of somebody else, in answer to somebody else's question. And so Joseph receives section four in answer to his father's question, what am I supposed to do to serve in the kingdom of God? Something that all of us <clears throat> probably have or asked ourselves or, or, or currently are or maybe should ask, and the answer comes to that question in the form of section four. I want to highlight just a couple of things. Joseph Smith Sr. was taught to serve, not with a specific calling, but just to serve God. If you have desires to serve God, you are called to the work. And then it goes through and gives some things that Joseph Smith Sr. and we need to have in our, um, as part of uh, the characteristics of our service. See that you serve him, meaning the Lord, with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. 
and make sure we have faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God, because that's what qualifies us for the work. And remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. It's a list of things that we need to work on, to strive to become better in, in order to more, uh, in order to magnify our calling more, more abundantly. Faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. But then I love verse seven. The Lord doesn't say, go develop all those characteristics and then come and see me. No, 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 it's all a process. He gives us that hope in verse seven, when he says, ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So as we, as we look to better serve the Lord by serving those around us, there's a lot of characteristics that we can improve on. But the Lord says, but ask and you shall receive. So one of the characteristics is being more patient. Do you need more patience? Ask. He'll give it to you. You don't have to go and read some self-help book, a guidebook or whatever, or, or, you know, whatever. Go get whatever to develop these characteristics. But simply ask and God will give it to us. Do you need more charity? Ask for it. He'll give it to you. Do you need to develop more love for an individual you've been called to serve or minister to? That's often the case. And what does the Lord say? Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In other words, ask me, the Savior says, ask how you can love that person more and I'll give it to you. I'll show you how. I won't just instantly give you the love, perhaps, perhaps you will, but in other ways it will be, you need to develop that love, but here are some things that you could do to increase your love for that individual. Knock and it shall be given unto you. How about another one? How about, uh, how about uh, uh, brotherly kindness? That's kind of the same as love. How about uh, serving with an eye single to the glory of God? Elder Bednar talked about that very thing in his talk in the most recent general conference, October 2023, about kind of the unsung heroes. He talked about to them of the last pioneers is a, a phrase that he used. Those who don't get the glory and the recognition and sit on the stand and and get the pat on the back, but who nevertheless serve faithfully and diligently. And sometimes in the world today that we live in, where uh, fame and recognition is is uh, a, a driving force of self worth, that's not the way that it works in the church. And sometimes we we need to pray and ask Heavenly Father to let me serve only for Thy glory, with an eye single to the glory, and for no other reasons. Anyway, we can take all those characteristics and kind of go through the same process with it. But I think we're getting the point. Let's go now to chapter, or let's stay in chapter 2, and we'll go to verse 19. So we've talked a lot about how to prepare to serve. Now we've talked about how to serve. And now Paul tells us why we should serve. In verse 19 of chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Or in other words, why do we do all this? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So he's asking, okay, I taught you the gospel. I invited you to come unto Christ. And why did I do it? Well, look at you. You're doing a great job. You've come unto Christ and you're prepared for his coming. For ye are, for ye are our glory and joy. So what do the teachers and the leaders get out of this? If done appropriately and according to the way Paul teaches, the happiness and joy of seeing others coming unto Christ. That's why we serve. Not to check it off our lengthy to-do list, but so that we can sit back one to, at, 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 at some moments and say, you know what? Look, they are rejoicing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are receiving the blessings of Heavenly Father. They are excited and enthusiastic about living according to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And that is where our our joy and happiness comes from and uh, in, in not, not much other other way than that. So now let's go to chapter four. And here we're going to change topics uh, quite dramatically. So we've talked about serving in the church, coming unto Christ ourselves and helping others do the same. And now Paul is going to be talking about the second coming. And this is where I'd like to conclude this video. 
looking at 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. So in chapter 4, Paul is talking about the resurrection and the second coming. We get to verse 17, uh, and, he's, and he's, he's talking about the second coming, and we find that right after the number 17, there's a letter A. It takes us to a footnote of a Joseph Smith translation, and it's quite a lengthy one. And so let, I'm going to just read straight out of, out of the footnote, JST, and he describes the second coming. Then they who are alive shall be caught up together into the clouds with them who remain to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be ever with the Lord. So he's describing the scene of the second coming. Here comes the Savior descending in his cloud of glory. And he's talking about us, the, the righteous members of the church and, and the righteous people of the, of the earth, I should say, rising up and meeting him and glorifying him. And then I love verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. That word comfort. Oftentimes we talk about the second coming. And in those conversations or in those lessons or in those talks or wherever we're getting that information, oftentimes the highlight or the focus is all the bad, dreary, unpleasant things that are going to accompany the second coming. Earthquakes, whirlwinds, crime, war, pestilence, rumors of war, disease, death, destruction. That's part of it. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But let's remember how it ends. Let's remember the purpose of the second coming. There is purpose and in, in, in part of the process that the wicked are going to be separated from the righteous. It's going to happen. But for those who are desirous to come unto Christ and strive to become more like him and to keep his commandments and laws and ordinances, they are going to be lifted up to meet him, to greet him. And that is something to look forward to and to have a desire to be a part of that wonderful event. And so I love with all the things that we could talk about, all the events, all the signs that lead up and comprise the second coming of Jesus Christ, I love that Paul reminds us to take comfort and to comfort one another with these words of talk of the second coming. And then we get down a little bit further in the chapter, or excuse me, in the next chapter, chapter five. And he continues to speak, Paul does, continues to speak about the second coming. And he gets to an interesting verse here. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about this because we just left a verse that says he's gonna come in his, in, in, his, uh, in, in his glory, in the clouds of glory. We're gonna, he's gonna descend, we're gonna rise up to greet him and meet him. But then just a couple of sentences later, Paul says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh. So it's coming, you know it is, but how does it come now in verse two? As a thief in the night. Now I love the imagery, the description. The way that I interpret and see it is a thief in the night. We don't know when that night is. And a thief in the night comes in disguise. He comes quietly. He comes undetected. He can come and perhaps even go. And so why is the second coming compared to a thief in the night under that description? Yet a couple of verses earlier, he's coming in his crowd of glory for the entire world to know and recognize. How do you have both? Well, fortunately, you don't have to take my word for it or my interpretation, but we'll read a quote from Bruce R. McConkie. And I'm actually going to go through a few quotes here from prophets and apostles that describe the events in sequence of the second coming, and it actually explains that answer. How does he come in his cloud of glory and as a thief in the night? So uh, first of three uh, quotes here, Bruce R. McConkie, before the Lord descends openly and publicly in the clouds of glory, as described by Paul in chapter 4. So before the Lord descends openly and publicly in the clouds of glory, attended by all the hosts of heaven, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord sends terror and destruction from one end of the earth to the other, before he stands on Mount Zion or sets his feet on Olivet, or utters his voice from an American Zion or a Jewish Jerusalem, before all flesh shall see him together, 
before any of his appearances, which taken together comprise the second coming of the Son of God, before all these there is to be a secret appearance to selected members of the church. He will come in private to his prophet and the apostles then living, those who have held keys and powers and authorities in all ages from Adam to the present will be present. Now, Bruce R. McConkie is talking about an event that will, he, he described it perfectly. I won't reiterate and restate everything he said, but this is to take place at a place called Adam on Diamon. Perhaps you have heard that phrase or that name. I've done a couple of videos on it, but it's at Adam on Diamon in which this event, which Bruce R. McConkie just described. We then come to a quote from Charles W. Penrose. He was not only a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the early 1900s, but he was also a member of the First Presidency, a counselor to Joseph F. Smith and Heber J. Grant. And this is what he says. So going in order here, we, the quote uh, from Bruce R. McConkie describing the events at Adam and Diamond, and then it's as if Charles Penrose picks right up. He says, Christ's next appearance, after his appearance in the New Jerusalem, or Adam and Diamond, will be among the distressed and nearly vanquished sons of Judah. At the crisis of their fate, when the hostile troops of several nations are ravaging the city and all the horrors of war are overwhelming the people of Jerusalem, he will set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, which will cleave and part asunder at his touch. Attended by a host of heaven, he will overthrow and destroy the combined armies of the Gentiles and appear to the worshiping Jews as the mighty deliverer and conqueror so long expected by their race. And while love, gratitude, awe, and admiration swell in their bosoms, the deliverer will show them the tokens of his crucifixion and disclose himself as Jesus of Nazareth, whom they had reviled and whom their fathers put to death. Then will unbelief depart from their souls, and the blindness in part which has happened unto Israel be removed. There's a lot in that verse, and I could and I probably should do a lengthy video about the second coming. Because after the events of Adam and Diamond, then the sons of Judah, the people of Judah, the Jews, are going to find themselves in a whole lot of trouble as there's nations combining against them, coming in from all borders, threatening the lives of the Jews who are in Israel, the country of Israel, because he says it's the people of Jerusalem. And just when their enemies are attacking and it looks that for the utter destruction of the Jewish nation there in Jerusalem in the country of Israel, then the Savior will come and he'll save them. I am kind of re putting in my own words this quote from Elder Penrose. But they'll look and they'll see their deliverer, their, 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 their Savior, the one who saved them from this political strife, this ultimate physical death. And they'll look to him as the promised Messiah, according to the Jews, one who would come to deliver them from political conflict. But then they'll see the wounds in his hands and feet and side, and they'll say, where did you receive these wounds? And then they will understand that the one they had been looking for, the promised Messiah, had come two millennium earlier as the babe of Bethlehem. Joseph, the carpenter. Joseph of Na or excuse me, Jesus, the carpenter. Jesus of Nazareth was actually the Savior, Lord, Redeemer, Son of God. Now, after those two appearances, <clears throat> those described, then after, excuse me, then after these two appearances, then will come what was described in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. So as a third appearance, the Lord will reveal himself to all nations, to the whole world. President Ezra Taft Benson talks about this. The third appearance of Christ will be to the rest of the world. All nations will see him in clouds of glory, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. And the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. 
That's the third and final second coming. So we have three second coming events. James E. Talmadge gives this uh, counsel. He says, The precise time of Christ's coming has not been made known unto man. By learning to comprehend the signs of the times, by watching the development of the work of God among the nations, and by noting the rapid fulfillment of significant prophecies, we may perceive the progressive evidence of the approaching event. Then he quotes from the Doctrine and Covenants, But the hour and the day no man knoweth, neither the angels of heaven, nor shall they know until he comes. But then Elder Talmadge continues his own words. His coming will be a surprise to those who have ignored his warnings and who have failed to watch. As a thief in the night will be the coming of the day of the Lord unto the wicked. Paul teaches that exact same thing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, I'm going to read a few verses here. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. So he just talked about the thief in the night, your people not knowing that he's coming. Elder Talmadge said, if you're not paying attention, he will come unexpectedly. But if you are paying attention, you'll know that his coming is nigh. And Paul says it the same. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, your saints, your true followers of Jesus Christ, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, meaning spiritually sleeping, but let us watch, spiritually watching, and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet, the hope of salvation. He's talking about the armor of God now. So for those who choose to put on the armor of God, and you're going to have to go study what that is. I'm not doing that in this video. But for those who put on the armor of God, he will not come as a thief in the night. Because you'll know, you'll see the signs, you'll be prepared, you'll be ready. And like Paul says at the end of chapter 4, you will receive comfort in the idea of the Lord's second coming. One other thing that I'll share with you is a quote from Elder Wilford, or President Wilford Woodruff. One day he was asked, when is the second coming going to happen, President? And President Wilford Woodruff simply replied, I am living my life as though it will happen tomorrow, but I am still planting my cherry trees. I say all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.